I'm going to start slowly. It's two and I have to be on time. Uh, thank you for coming uh, for this talk. So it's going to be about scaling vector data solutions for Gen AI. Quick intro about myself. Uh, I'm Stefan. I'm a developer advocate at Smilvis. Uh, you can find all my socials here if you have any questions related to Gen AI, vector database, AI in general. Uh, feel free to hit me up. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, or my email address as well if you want. Quick intro, Milvis, we are part of the Linux Foundation for AI and data. Uh, we like to say that we're easy to set up, also feature rich. We have like a lot of different features like supporting dense embeddings, sparse embeddings. I'll go more into details on what it means as well uh, later on. And we're fully open source. Uh, you can check us out, check us out sorry, directly on GitHub um, and everything. We're also well connected in the LLM infrastructure world, so you know, like whoever you're using, usually we have an integration with them. So think of like Langchain, Lama Index, Haystack, Semantic Kernel, all, all different people. Also, we support embedding models directly, support LLMs directly, direct integration with them. Uh, we also have hardware uh, partnerships directly with NVIDIA and Intel, uh, meaning that we optimize vector search on some Intel uh, on some Intel CPUs and NVIDIA GPUs as well. So we have um, if at, at one at one scale at one point. Sometimes you want GPU search, so we have that uh, with NVIDIA. But usually, people some people ask me like, what are the use cases you know for like vector database in general or AI? Uh, here are nine use cases uh, where we have our customers. So the first one is RAG, uh, retrieval augmented generation. That's the one that if you're in the AI world, you know the one you've been hearing for like the past year or something. Uh, we also have recommender systems, so a bit a bit more old school, you know, or like you want to personalize your app or your system, then you can do that. We have different, you know, semantic search, uh, image search, video search, audio as well, molecular search as well. We have some uh, companies creating proteins, for example, uh, using artificial intelligence, and then they do molecular search. You can do anomaly detection. And uh, last but not least, uh, multimodal similarity search, which means you know searching uh, for images, audio, and text, for example, at the same time. But who knows how about vector database here? Who knows how they work? One, two, some people. Okay, cool. So I just have like a quick intro um, so that you like everyone can follow because basically. Traditional databases uh, are cool, uh, but they're built on exact search, meaning you know, like you want to do like a select, I don't know, project or, or person in your table, and then if you have this person, then you will have a result. But if you don't have this person, then you will have nothing. Also, you might miss the context or the semantic meaning or the user intent. You know, if you search for apple, are going to searching for the fruit or the company, and if you're searching for like changing car tire. Are you searching for when to change your car tire or how to do it? So that's basically why we have vector database. And also, a lot of data is unstructured data, meaning that you know, like you actually have it to make it through a deep learning model to understand it. Uh, and traditional databases can't understand those. So that's the reason usually why you would uh, maybe go for a vector database as well on top of your normal one. And you know, you have a lot of discussions, especially if you go on Hacker News. Uh, people would be like, oh, why do you even need a vector database? Uh, you can do a NumPy KNN. You know, it's a classic Hacker News comment, uh, which don't get me wrong. Sometimes it's useful. The problem with that uh, is that usually scale is the problem. Um, so at one point, for to reach a real scale, uh, your NumPy KNN will struggle. Also, what happens if you want to do some upsets? What happens if you do some deletion uh, and different things? You know, at one point, you can start that way, but you're going to build a vector database in the end. Um, if you do it that way. Also, you have search libraries, which are very useful in some cases, but they also might lack, you know, some different features like search quality. What about hybrid search? What about filtering? Um, what about scalability? You know, like if you want a billion of vectors, it might be a struggle for you. Uh, what about the cost? Are you going to store everything in memory? Or are you going to put something on the disk or on S3? Uh, and then if you, you know, like they usually store everything in memory. And then what about security as well? Uh, it can be a problem. You know, privacy, for example, you might not be able to filter out uh, the different um, vectors that you have. So we have Milvus, basically. Uh, we say, as, as I said before, you know, we like to say that we're easy to start, so it's a pip install. 
uh, Pi Milvis, and then you can run everything locally on your laptop. But the good part is that we can also scale up. So, you know, like we have um, Milvis Lite, which is ideal for prototyping or small experiments. Uh, it's a bit installed by Milvis. It's scaled to about a million vectors. Then we have Milvis Standalone, which is a single node deployment. This one is bundled directly in the Docker image. So you just do a Docker pool and then you can run it. Um, we have primary and secondary for this one. And it can scale up to about 100 million vectors. So that's already a pretty consequent scale usually. And then if you go really big scale, uh, then we have Milvis Distributed. This one runs on Kubernetes. Uh, it has a load balancer. We support multi-node multi management. Uh, also what's cool is that you can scale up each component individually. I'll talk more later in details about like which component is, is doing what. And this one scale up to about 100 billion vectors. So we basically offer everything you need. Uh, you just write your code once and then the API and the SDK are the same for all of them. So then you can, you know, just, you basically just change your URL to point to your cluster and then that's it. You're just uh, accessing Milvis distributed. Also a bit like different technologies, you know, uh, so we have like different index types. Usually people talk about one index, which is HNSW. This one runs everything in memory and that's cool. But then, you know, it can be also very costly. So we support like different indexes like disk NN, for example, which runs uh, on disk. Uh, I've also mentioned it before. We support GPU indexes uh, with NVIDIA directly. And then we also support different search types. Uh, you know, not only dense search, um, but we also have metadata filtering, grouping, multiple vector search at the same time. And yeah, we also have uh, compute types personalization. So we also work with Intel directly uh, for like some specific Intel CPUs. And yeah, basically the scale, if you don't run on Kubernetes, we're talking about a 10, 10 billion vectors. So that's what you can have uh, in a single Milvis uh, instance. And otherwise, if you're running some communities, we're talking about 100 billion vectors. Uh, it's actually a customer of ours that has this one, so it's actually running already. Um, and yeah, it's everything's running on communities, uh, and they have about 100 billion vectors. Maybe for the people that are not familiar with, uh, where do vectors come from though? You know, I've mentioned vectors, I guess, probably 20 times since the beginning of this presentation. Uh, but where do they come from? Uh, you have to think. So you have your documents, which is, you know, your knowledge base your images, your, your text, your videos, or everything. And then you put that through a deep learning model. And what happens is that you're gonna cut off the last layer. So, you know, usually if you were to put it in a deep learning model, then it will give you a prediction. It will give you a prediction. Oh yes, there's a cat actually in this picture. You don't want that. You don't care about the prediction. You just wanna, you care about what the model has learned. So that's why you cut off the last layer because at this point, the model has like, it will tell you everything it has learned uh, and that's how you get the vectors. Um, so then you store those directly in your vector database. And that's then how you can then talk to your data, basically. And quick, like very simple use case, but that basically looks like that. You have your text, you put it through an embedding model, and then you have a list of vectors, uh, which is usually a list of floats. Then everything is projected. So just so you understand, like here we're projecting in 3D. It's obviously not projecting in 3D when you run it, uh, but then things that are very similar in meaning, they're going to be very close to each other. So um, if you talk about a dog with a smile, for example, it's going to be very close to like a happy dog wagging your tail, but it's going to be quite far from uh, an image of a surfer, for example, and then very far from an image of like buildings and things. And so everything is projected in the vector space, and that's then how you can um, do the vector search. And so how does it work? Basically, uh, this is how it works. So we do similarity search everywhere, meaning you have your data, you put it, you transform it into vectors, so you use your deep learning model. Then you have your vector embeddings, you store them uh, in your database. And then on the other hand, you have your user or yourself, you're performing a query. Then you're going to transform this query uh, into with using the same embedding models as you used before. And then you're going to perform a similarity search, basically. Then you're going to find the things that are the most similar to your query and to what is stored in the database, and then we'll return the results. So that's how it works. Not too complicated, you know, that's also why usually people are like, oh, why not you use NumPy KNN? You know, I've mentioned it before, if you try to do that at 100 billion scale, good luck. 
Um, and so how do we achieve then billion scale, you know, uh, on Kubernetes? So first for us, uh, we're fully using open source. So we're using MinIO to store our vectors and indexes, meaning that using that allows us basically to be fully stateless. You know, there's, I've been, run, I've been working in the Kubernetes world for a couple of years now, and people back then were like, you should never run a database in the Kubernetes, you know? There was a big thing, never do that in your life. You're looking for troubles. Uh, so yeah, we're fully stateless, so that's not a problem. Um, and then we use Kafka or Pulsar to handle data insertion and also real-time updates to Milbus. Um, so like, you know, you have data coming, you can query it directly, uh, even before it actually uh, arrives in the index. We push everything to, Prometh to Prometheus and Grafana. So then, you know, you have like your real-time monitoring and then we have the different CRGs as well for Kubernetes. That's uh, the architecture. Uh, I won't go into too much details here, uh, but basically the worker nodes are just the one doing the work. They just get the data directly from either Kafka or Pulsar from a log broker. Uh, and then they're going to store those uh, directly into S3 uh, or anything that is similar to S3. And yes, so you have all the query uh, coordinators, basically, are always talking to the query node, data coordinator to the data node, uh, and you, you see the idea. And then uh, all the nodes, all the worker nodes, they're just pods. So you can just, you know, sort of like scale them up and down. Uh, and then they're reading directly from the log broker and then storing everything into S3. And then we use etcd uh, for our metadata store. Uh, and that's basically our architecture. And just going into big details a bit, uh, a bit so you understand more how Milvis works. So everything is sharded by default. Um, so we really distribute everything, which allows us to then, you know, have a better ingestion rate uh, as you would usually. Uh, and then we call, we have something that is called segment. And a segment is just, um, you know, a unit of data in Milvis. So you have a segment that is within a partition and this partition is within uh, a collection. Then, you know, we get our data directly from Kafka, let's say. Um, so this, we put it into a growing segment, which is just some data that is pushed, you know, that is arriving in real time. And then we build a brute force index. Um, so then we can really query real time data. At one point, you reach a certain threshold. Uh, and this, you then move it to a sealed segment. And this one is immutable. And that's where we build actually the real indexes. That's where we build like HNSW, for example, all those different indexes. Then, um, we have uh, compaction, and this one is basically merging segments, you know, because you might, I don't know, add new data, or you might remove some data. Um, so then you need to, you know, like, rebuild some new segments and everything. <laughs> then, once you build a new segment, you're going to build a new index, and then you replace them. And, bless you. Um, and then, yeah, everything is running, uh, as I said, you know, in object storage. So that's we like, we have a way of basically optimizing for performance and also cost efficiency. Uh, we're also using metadata uh, and access patterns to classify your data as like either hot or cold. Um, and then we really optimize, you know, for data retrieval. So the, what the data that we think is hot going to be in memory and the other one will be in the object storage. Then we have, you know, some optimization for query routing. Um, and yeah, also like we can adapt our resource allocation dynamically depending on what's happening. So if you're building an index, you know, we might, you know, scale up the index node. Uh, and if you're really like running a very big query, then we might scale up the query node. So you don't have to do that yourself. Um, yes. So as I said before, we're fully stateless. Uh, everything in the middle of this runs on the, is a deployment. Uh, if you're talking Kubernetes world, meaning you can scale everything up and down uh, very easily. Usually you run an HPA on top, um, you know, so you're going to base it on some custom metrics we have. Uh, that we push, for example, in Prometheus. And then, you know, if your query latency becomes too high, then you can scale that up uh, automatically. And then you can also have node affinity. So, you know, like you might want to run the query node or some specific nodes of your Kubernetes cluster. And then the data node on others, you know, because they have different needs. And then maybe, you know, for vector search at a crazy scale, then, you know, sometimes you want to run on GPU nodes. So then you can also define, hey, please, for this specific query, uh, you can run on the GPU node. So, yes, that was basically the quick intro on how we can do it. Uh, and now we're going to go a bit more into the details of actually how to do it at scale. Um, then I'll talk about drag and then I have a demo, which I actually do it at scale.
ish. It's 35 million vectors. It's not crazy scale, but it's still a nice scale. So first, index strategies. Uh, people usually, you know, don't really talk about indexing. That's a key part on actually how to achieve scale. Um, you have different index strategies, you know, cluster one, graph, hash, or tree. I'm only going to talk about cluster and graph uh, from now on. So you have the classic one, the flat. It's a brute force. Uh, it's one that can actually work, you know, it can work at scale, uh, but it doesn't work to like crazy scale, you know. And then how it works is that you have your data point, they're projected into some space, and then you have your query, and then you're going to run nearest neighbor on all the points. So like, you know, it's, it can be very quick, uh, but at one point, if you have 10 billion vectors, you're going to do 10 billion operations, that doesn't scale. But at small scale, it works well. You have inverted file flat, IVF flat. Uh, this one, similar, except uh, instead of like searching for all the points, you're going to search through the centroids. So basically, every partition is created, and then you have a centroid, uh, and then we um, store that into Milvis, and we store it actually as a partition. So when you run your query, you know, you're going to have your query here. Instead of, you know, querying and searching the nearest neighbor for all the points, you're just going to go through the nearest centroid. Then you go into this partition, uh, and then you make the vector search and the nearest neighbors on only this partition. So that allows you, instead of, you know, I don't know, let's say you have uh, 20 million vectors, instead of searching for 20 million vectors, you might search for like 10,000. So it really reduces uh, the vector space. So that's also a nice one. Um, and then you have the classic HNSW, hierarchical navigable small world. That's the one that is usually uh, used by default. This one is nice, uh, but it's a graph based. So it runs everything, like the graph is fully stored in the memory. So you might sometimes, you know, like it's quite a costly one. Uh, also, if you want to build it, if you want to update it, then you have to usually rebuild the entire index, meaning the whole graph. So that can take a very long time. But basically how it works, you start at the top layer uh, and then you're going to have a point, you know, you're going to have your query and then you're going to look for the nearest neighbor. Then we're going to go deep, uh, we're going to go to the layer one, which has a bit more points, and then the layer zero, which is the bottom part, has all the points, and then you're just going to find the nearest point to your query. So then you can be very quick uh, doing that because it's just graph-based. So yes, pick an index, but you know, like make sure to pick the right one. Uh, if you want to have, you know, like 100% accuracy, then you have to use flat. The rest is using approximations. Um, but then depending on, you know, the size of your index, you might have some better ones. If you have, I don't know, 100 billion vectors, you'll very likely have to use a disk-based disk -based indexes as well. Uh, yes, and we have a whole blog post uh, talking about that if you want to check it out. But, so that's the first part, you know, it's the vector search. But then I also mentioned a couple of times uh, filtering, you know, which really allows you to scale down um, for the search. So you can filter on metadata. So then, you know, you really have a search based reduction. So instead of, you know, searching 20 million vectors, 100 million vectors, maybe you'll do it on 1,000, on 10,000, you know, so it's way faster. We also use some bit set operations, uh, basically to really like make the filtering extremely quick. Uh, and we also build an index on top of that. So like, you know, all the metadata we have, uh, we're going to build an index, which is the classic one you might have heard of, you know, Bloom filter or hash or tree based. So we do that before you actually, you know, like run the vector search, meaning that uh, you really like the space search is really, really small if you have proper uh, metadata. And then we do our search. So the, the way we do it, like everything is fully distributed. I mentioned it already in the past. Uh, so it's distributed across sh some shards. Um, and each query node is basically doing the search on its own query node. And then we gather everything and then we send everything back to the proxy and then the proxy is the one, you know, giving the result back. So that meaning like everything is running in parallel so we don't have to wait. So yes, if you want to do things at scale, usually it's like the right index, then do some filtering and then you can do some vector search and then you're pretty happy with that. And I don't know if you've, has everyone heard about frag in the room? Yes, I guess, maybe. So yeah, retrieval augmented generation. 
Basic idea, you know, you force your LLM to work with your data. Uh, if everyone has heard about it, I won't go too much details. Um, but that's, you know, like uh, some reasons why it's also so popular is like, you know, against an LLM, your knowledge of the LLM might be out of date. Uh, also, your LLM doesn't know about private knowledge. Um, it also helps reducing hallucinations. I'm insisting on the reducing. Uh, RAG doesn't remove hallucinations. Uh, so be careful, you know, like you might, you might have some texts that are very similar. Let's say the Lyft earnings and the Uber earnings. And if you ask a question about Uber, maybe the LLM will give you an answer about Lyft because they're very, very similar documents. So be careful. Reducing hallucinations doesn't remove them. Uh, and then you have RAG against fine tuning. Uh, fine tuning can be amazing, but it's also a bit more expensive and it's more time consuming. Uh, whereas RAG is also pluggable. That's the basic architecture. You know, you're going to have your data, you're going to extract the content. And then you're going to do what we call chunking. So it's basically dividing your content, you know, into like some uh, different parts. Then you put that through an embedding model. That's, you know, with the one we've seen, for example, in the past. So then you get to vectors and then you store those uh, directly in the database. And then you have your query again through the same embedding model. And then you do a semantic search. We return the similar data and we put that back into the context of the LLM. You know, we're going to be like, okay, uh, before you give a reply, here are the um, most similar data, and then the LLM will take that, and then it will give you a response that is usually nicer. And that's a basic RAG architect architecture. And if you do the simple one with Lama index, it's five lines. Uh, so, you know, you're going to read your data, you load it, you parse it, uh, then you put it through your embedding model, then you're going to index it, and then you have your query engine, you know, so then you can actually talk with it. Um, and then it, that's when you can ask some questions. And if you want to do it at scale, uh, don't forget filtering, you know, like you can filter our metadata that we don't have to search through everything. Um, you can also do vector search or hybrid search, you know, instead of like only searching through vectors, you can also do like keyword search at the same time, you know, and then, yeah, so that's called hybrid search now. Uh, we support it as well. So then uh, feel free to do that. And we also support multi-vector search. So if you have, you know, like different vector, multi-vectors, sorry, in your document, you can also do that, uh, which is also very good for multimodal, for example. GPU search at one point if you reach a really big scale. And don't forget about dynamic updates. So real-time inserts and updates as well of your data, because otherwise, you know, you might be outdated as well for your rank. Um, so yes, then you can scale up with Kubernetes, you know, auto scaling based on the query load or the data size, and then we're going to scale uh, things up for you. And that was all for my talking. Uh, now it's uh, into action. Uh, I like to live dangerously. I only do live demos. Um, so let's go. So yes, this I have this notebook. I'll share the code after. Uh, but basically the goal, you know, we have. Um, I'm going to use Zillis Cloud, which is, you know, the cloud offering, uh, just because I was too lazy to create a whole Kubernetes cluster and then insert everything. But it's exactly the same. Uh, so I'm just going to check the state, you know, make sure it's actually loaded. Otherwise, I can't do the demo. I'm going to show some filtering, how it works, and, you know, what you can do with it. Uh, then I'm going to use Coherent Embeddings to run semantic search, because the data I'm using is Wikipedia embeddings. They were generated by Cohere, so then I actually have to use Coherent Embeddings. Then we're going to do RAG at scale-ish, 35 million vectors. Um, so yes, let's go. So we're using Milibus, we're using Coherent Embeddings. Uh, I'm just going to load my environment variables, you know, because I'm using Zillis Cloud and I'm using Cohere. So first, we're going to do it, but we're going to do it without semantic search. So Milibus, you know, we support semantic search, but we also have filtering. And then we have prefix, uh, infix, and suffix filtering. So that, for example, you know, you can filter for like titles and then uh, you can, you know, do infix, postfix, and then we also support wildcard. So I'm just going to connect to my client. I only have one connection, uh, which is the Cohere Embeddings. So I'm just going to define this name. And now I'm just going to get some stats about the connection. So you can see I'm not lying. Uh, so we have 33.5 million uh, embeddings. And for the index, uh, so on the cloud, we have like something that is automatic, but it's HNSW uh, with a cosine uh, matrix. So let's check. I'm going to make sure my connection is loaded. 
thank God it is. Uh, otherwise, you know, we have to actually load it in memory and load the index. Otherwise, I just can't do a vector search. So I don't need to load the collection. But I can describe it, you know. So we can see, yeah, we have the name. Then we have the different fields. So I have um, an ID, which is my primary field. Then I have my embeddings, uh, which are the vectors. So those were transformed. The dimension is 1024. That's a dimension of the embedding uh, outputs uh, generated by Co here. So I don't really have a say here. And then I'm also saving uh, a part of the text and a part of the title as well for the Wikipedia article. That way, if I actually search for something, you know, like I can output the text uh, and the title so that I actually have an idea of what's happening. So first, uh, I'm going to do some filtering. So, you know, I'm actually not going to do a vector search at all. I'm going to run a query uh, and I just want the documents that, have, that are about British Arab Commercial Bank. If you're asking me why, it's the first one uh, that I have in my embedding, so that's why I got the title. Uh, but yes, so we can do that. Uh, and then, you know, you can see I'm only filtering on the title, so I'm only getting data uh, about this one. Um, and then, yeah, we'll have like, you know, it's a head of the head office is in London. They have different offices in Algeria, in Libya, uh, and in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, so yes, so that's like one example on how you can do filtering. There's a lot. Uh, then you can also, you know, do infix. So then I can have something, you know, which is about uh, Calictasia. Uh, so it's something, you know, you just make sure you have the text there. And then it's the same, you know, like the title is about that. So, you know, it's like it's a plant apparently. Um, and then you get your results and then you're pretty happy. But then you can also do the opposite. So you can do like something that is not in, which is also very useful. So we can do, you know, something that is not in the British Arab Commercial Bank or in Khalid Katia. I should have changed, should have chosen something else that I can actually pronounce, uh, but you can, you can see it. And then, you know, I'm just saying, so title not in that, and I'm outputting I'm title in the text. So then we just have like, you know, other random data uh, that we have. And that's, that's a cool part, that's filtering, you know, but then maybe you want to do something that is a bit better. So then you want to do semantic search. So, as I said, we're going to use Cohere and Milvus. Uh, and then, you know, we can like, uh, we have a direct, uh, Milvus has a direct integration with Cohere. So we don't have, you know, we can just um, use our my API key and then we don't have to actually use Cohere. We can do it directly with Milvus. So I'm using this embedding model. This one is supporting multiple languages. Uh, and it's, I need to use this one because this is the one that has been used for Wikipedia. So, you know, if I want to have something that is coherent, then I need to use the same one. So here is a, like, a list of documents that I'm going to encode, uh, just so you have an idea of what it, how it works. So we have, you know, a list of string, uh, different things, you know, and then uh, Open Source Summit is a conference umbrella. It has, you know, different things. Uh, also, I'm talking about Lin uh, Linux, Linux uh, which was created by Linux. Uh, and then basically it looks like that, you know. So you have uh, your documents, and then you put it through an embedding model, and then I'm just showing uh, a part of the first embedding that I created, you know. So then you have that, but instead of having 10, uh, you have 1024. And that's how then you can do a semantic search. And, you know, now I can finally encode my query. So that's, you know, I've shown you in the graph before, where as a user, you know, you can make the query, then I put it through the same embedding model, uh, and then you can like, who created the OS Linux? And that's my response. Uh, and then you're like, okay, that's cool, cool stuff, but I don't understand that. So then it's like, okay, then how can you understand it? Uh, then it's like, you know, you're gonna have uh, different outputs. So I'm defining, please output the field text because I'm saving it at the same time. So then, you know, we do like, uh, we do the search, uh, approximate nearest neighbor search, but then I'm also, you know, putting the text so then I can finally understand what's happening. Uh, so we can see, you know, Linux began in 1991 as a personal project by Finnish student Linus Torvald. And then we'll have this, the distance. Um, and then that's, you know, we're getting like the highest distance, um, which is like the smallest to us, basically. Uh, and then, you know, you get like a couple of results. Uh, and that's basically it. That's how you do semantic search. And that's how you can do that for your product. Um, and yes. But, you know, since the beginning, I'm just going to run it now, but since the beginning, I've only run a search with one query, you know, which is not what you would have in production. So I'm just going to like generate some random queries 
I'm just rendering uh, generating a thousand vectors. Uh, and then I'm doing the vector search at the same time. So like at the moment in the background, we're doing a thousand uh, vector search. And what I want to show you here is that, you know, I was not like trying to cheat on how fast it can be. It's just like here is just like random vectors um, and that's over. Um, and yeah, like we don't really care about the results, but I want to show you now. I'm going to show you the P99 uh, of the vector search. So then you can maybe believe me when I say that it's fast because those were actually generated randomly. So I'm just going to check the metrics of my cluster um, and hopefully we should have the metrics and hopefully it was not too long. So we can see, you know, like the CU uh, computation and capacity that are just, um, we don't really care about those. But uh, oh, I was scared. Apparently my latency was very high. Ah, no. Cool. Uh, so we can see the P99 uh, of my search. So we can see like it's 4.96 milliseconds, so about five milliseconds. So that's, uh, you know, like that's really the P99 for my thousands. And those were like randomly generated, you know, it was not like any me trying to cheat on something. Uh, and yeah, here yeah, that was the query. That's why it was so high because it's when I did the filtering, when I did the not in and everything, you know, so that's one, uh, it actually takes a, a bit more time. Uh, but yeah, so about five, five milliseconds, you know, for the P99 for about a, a thousand search. But now I want to make my result look pretty in the first place. Uh, so then I can actually use them uh, with my rack system. So we're just going to get, you know, the, the text and then we're going to get the distance um, and that's about it. So it looks like that. Same result as before, but now I can actually give it back to my LLM. So for this demo, I'm using Olama and I'm using Llama 3.1. So it's running on my laptop. Uh, and then, you know, I can like, I'm giving the, getting ready the context of the LLM, you know, what I'm gonna give back to the LLM because I'm not using any framework here. So I'm basically doing the job of the framework. You know, it's basically what they do, but they hide that for you. So we, can, we have the same question, who created the OS Linux? And then this is my prompt uh, where I'm like, you're an AI assistant, you know, you're about to find answers. Yeah, usually, at the beginning of the prompt, you'll be like, you're an expert as whatever. They like, you know, to be like, to tell, they like when they, you tell them that they're an expert. And then we're like giving back the context. So this is what I defined earlier. Um, and then this is the question uh, that I have here. And that's basically how then, you know, your LLM will understand uh, and then we'll be able to use the data. So it's the same here. I'm using Olama uh, and I'm using Llama 3.1. And let's see if it actually works. So my question was, who created the OS Linux? Then, you know, it's searching everything into Milvus. And then, yay. So it's based on provided context. You know, it's the context that I gave back to the LLM with all my vector search. And then we can see the answer to the question is Linux Torvalds. And yes, that's basically it. My demo, everything worked, so I'm happy. Uh, yes. You know, like give us a star on GitHub if you want, that really helps for us. We're fully open source. Uh, add me on LinkedIn if you have any questions. Uh, and I will zoom out so you can have both. And thank you. I'm right on time. Do we have any questions? Uh, I have a question. Yes. It's like, I mean, usually you can see like this one, it's just like, it's a better, like the answer is just better in the first place. And then you have to think of like, this is a very simple question, but sometimes, you know, you might have like some very complicated questions or you might have a question where well, I'm asking three questions, you know? And then it's like, then the vector search will not be able to answer or will be confused, you know? It's like, who created, like if I, instead of having that, this question here, if I have who created the OS Linux, and uh, what about Intel or something? You know, then when I run my vector search, then you might be confused because it's like, oh, like we have technically two different information. Okay. Another question? Yes. Uh, so the initial embeddings when you created, so what was the source of your embedding? Which model? It's Cohere embeddings. What so you? it's Cohere multilingual embeddings v3, I think. Uh, yes, it's this one. Thank you. Yes. 
What, sorry? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it depends, but like we usually use park it and then we like load it, for example. Yeah, there's like really, like Milbase is fully open source. There's nothing, nothing was like hidden or anything. Yes. Yes. So semantic search, uh, it's cool, but you know, sometimes, as I said, you know, you might have like some uh, data that is very similar one to the other and hybrid search, you can do some keyword search. So then, you know, instead of just doing the semantic search, you're going to do it on one side. On the other side, you're going to do keyword search. So like, you know, if it's something about Uber, then we're really going to look for something that is about Uber, you know, like the classic algorithms like TFIDF or something. And then we have a result from the best semantic search from the keyword search. Then you usually use a re-ranker, combine both. And then you're like, oh, you know, re-ranker is it's another machine learning model. And it's like, oh, semantically, those are nice. And you know, like the text uh, keyword is like you're giving something else. And then you're weighing, you know, like the different results. And then you have usually a better result. It adds a bit of cost, latency, but then you know it really depends on your use case. Yes. No worries. Yes, so we use Face, for example, like Face is part of the, it's in the stack of Milvus. Uh, so usually I see it as like, you're gonna play around at the beginning, you know, you have like, I don't know, 100,000 vectors or something. You know, you know, you won't have any updates, you won't really have any deletions or anything because then you have to handle those. Uh, so it's more like, you know, you really like, you're gonna start something and then it's an import Face, I don't remember the name, but you know, uh, and that's usually the way I would go for it. Any others? Cool. Well, thank you very much and have a lovely day in Vienna. And it's sunny, I think, outside. So <laughs> thank you.